Hey there, welcome back to another review, this time of the 2016 action comedy, The Nice Guys. Now, The Nice Guys is a film that I have been looking forward to uh, ever since it was announced, ever since I saw the trailers for it. It looked like my type of movie, it looked entertaining, looked like fun, looked like a return to form for writer-director Shane Black. And uh, I went and saw it on Saturday night with uh, my mom and my stepdad and I can say this I, I did like the movie I did find it entertaining and I thought it was a pretty nice film but I would be lying to you if I said that I wasn't a little bit disappointed by its overall quality as a whole I really thought this film was going to be great I thought this was going to be an instant classic. I thought this was going to be like one of Shane Black's best, but it felt like an entertaining, but still really not as good as it can be type movie. It felt like a movie to me personally that didn't live up to its full potential. And, you know, if the worst thing that ever happened was that The Nice Guys was just a nice movie, I mean, that's not really that bad. But, I expected a little bit more than that from this film, so it's a little bit disappointing to me that the, the ultimate result is an above average movie that I won't run and buy right away when it comes out on home video. Like, I wouldn't mind adding it to my collection someday, but it's not like a film that I'm going to be running out and put on my wish list right away and, and buy it. I personally don't feel it's an 8 out of 10 film like it is on IMDb or a five-star flick, let alone even a four-star flick. Um, and I definitely don't think it's an A-plus film either. But I seem to be one of the few people who don't think it's the best movie, one of the best films of the year. Um, but this is just my opinion. If you love the movie, you think it's great, I mean, that's fine. Uh, I have no problem with that. I, I don't hate the film, folks. I just think it's okay. I like it. I like the movie. I think it's above average. Um, but I just don't think it's a great film. Um, but that's just my opinion, and I will uh, explain why I feel that way soon enough. But anyway, the film is uh, just came out recently. It came out on uh, May 20th. It's directed by Shane Black. This is the third film that he's directed. The first film he directed was a film called Kiss Kiss Bang Bang, which I honestly liked a lot more than this. And there's a lot of similarities between this and Kiss Kiss Bang Bang. I know this is written first, but Kiss Kiss Bang Bang was made first. So th there's no way it's going to escape some sort of comparison, especially when it's very similar in terms of its plot. Both films deal with two sort of uh, two unlikely pairings, two unlikely pairs who team up uh, and try to solve a case. And they try to find a missing girl. It's very similar. In a lot of ways, instead of uh, trying to do social commentary on Hollywood as a whole, uh, and like it did in Kiss Kiss Bang Bang, this time it's about the porn industry and little bits of the auto industry, some of the stuff that was going on in the 70s, in the late 70s, the time, the time period that this film is taking place in. So there definitely is some similarities, and I gotta be honest, Kiss Kiss Bang Bang, if you ask me, is a much better film. Um, but that's just me. It's also produced by Joel Silver, who, of course, has produced a lot of things that Shane Black has worked on. Uh, it stars, you know, Shane Black also helped write it, uh, along with Anthony Bagarazzi. And it stars Russell Crowe, Ryan Gosling, Angry Rice, Matt Bomer, uh, Margaret Qualley, Keith David, Kim Basinger. You also have uh, Muriel Tellio as a porn star, Misty Mountains. And uh, Belle Knapp, who plays Blueface. That's pretty much, that's the main cast for the film, really. Um, Russell Crowe and Ryan Gosling are your leads. You have a newcomer in Angry Rice, who's been in a few other, I don't know if I said her name correctly. She's a 15-year-old actress. She's been in a few other films before this, but this is like her first big movie. And I, I thought she pretty much, I thought she was really good. And I'll, I'll explain why soon enough. Uh, the film is edited by Joel Negron. It features cinematography by Philippe Rousselot, Russo or Rousselot. It features music by David Buckley and John Ottman, who worked on the score. And the movie was made for about a budget of $50 million. They did, they did, they did a good job with its budget. 
Um, they used a good amount of it to make the film look somewhat like it takes place in 1977 in Los Angeles, but it's kind of a, uh, it's definitely a wishful thinking version of 1977 Los Angeles. It's like Shane Black's what he likes about the 70s put in the movie. Whether or not it's historically accurate for the time period doesn't really matter. He just creates this kind of interesting sort of smorgasbord of 70s styles and 70s stuff that he really likes. And he put them in the film. And it creates a very sort of fantasy 70s sort of aspect to it. Kind of reminded me of the same sort of faux 70s sort of production design and art direction you'd see in films like Starsky and Hutch. Uh, and I would have preferred if it was a little bit closer to uh, actual 70s, you know, actual 1977 Los Angeles or, the, or, or you know, late 70s. But, you know, because it does feel at times like it's just the clothes are the only things that, and there's a few other th elements that are 70s, but it just doesn't really feel natural to me. That it doesn't help either that the film is shot in digital, and I really think it would have helped a lot in terms of giving the film this genuine 70s uh, movie feel. Uh, you know, 42nd Street feel if it actually was shot on film and not on digital. Um, but yeah, there's the basic gist of the plot is this. There's these two uh, bumbling PIs, uh, Russell Healy, uh, uh, Ru Jackson Healy, uh, who play, who's played who's played by Russell Crowe, and uh, Detective, uh, he's more of an enforcer. He's not really a PI, but he also kind of does some things every now and then. So you have an enforcer and a PI. He's not really a private investigator. So you have Russell Crowe, who plays Enforcer Jackson Healy, Ryan Gosling as P.I. Holland March. And then you have his Ryan Gosling's daughter, Holly, played by Angry, Angry Rice. And you have a few other cast members, you know, playing different roles, like Matt Bomer plays a hitman named John Boy, as a reference to Richard Thomas's character in uh, The Waltons. And understandably, because he, he, he kind of looks like Richard Thomas, he's got a mole on his face. So that's why he has the name John Boy. Uh, Margaret Qualey, who plays Amelia Kuttner, who is the girl that they're looking for that's gone missing. Um, Muriel Talio, Muriel Talio plays Misty Mountain. She's in in the film briefly. She's the really big porn star, uh, and she literally crashes crashes through this kid's uh, front door while he's looking at her uh, nudie photo in a magazine, and. Uh, People try to investigate her her murder, so to speak. You have Keith David. He's in it as just older guy. He's just kind of just has some muscle for the bad guys. Kim Basinger is in it in a really brief role as Judith Kuttner, Amelia's mother. She also happens to be the head of the Department of Justice. Uh, Kim Basinger, she looks great. Uh, I she was one of the few. She was one of the only things about the Grudge Match that I liked, and she does okay with what she has to work with here. It's just not much. Um, so yeah, that's the cast. Uh, when it comes to other things like the score, like I mentioned earlier, it's not much. There's nothing memorable about the score, which is kind of disappointing. Could have had a little bit more of a 70s sort of, you know, in the opening credits, it's totally got that 70s sort of, you know, watch it, watch it, whack it, whack whack it, you know, that kind of, you know, 70s sort of uh, uh, percussion and, and sound. And it was, I have to admit, it, was, it definitely was a fun thing to see the old Warner Brothers logo in the beginning of the movie. Art direction is good, uh, even though, yeah, it is kind of not really, doesn't really feel like the real thing. It still is, uh, it's still nice to look at, to see how the, the art directors and the production designers, they created uh, this, uh, this recreation of a, a what... Shane Black would want 1977 Los Angeles to look like. So, yeah, they did a good job with the budget, uh, using their resources well. Sadly, though, the film's not doing very well. It's it's only made about 12.9 million dollars, and it'd be lucky if it even breaks even, uh, let alone makes a profit. I, I'm I'm not surprised because it does sound like a film that honestly is a tough sell anyway. Um, but I, I would have to say. Even though I didn't love the movie, I still liked it. And if you are interested in the film, if you like the trailers, definitely give it a look. I'd rather see people pay their money to see a film like this versus 
the Angry Birds movie. So I, I hope it does better. I hope it at least makes some sort of a profit. Um, I have my doubts, but we'll see what happens. Now we're going to get into the part of the review where I talk about the things about the film that I liked and the things about, about it that I didn't. Now, there's, and then of course, get my final thoughts on it. Now, there's going to be some spoilers here. I'll, I'll warn you guys when I get, in it, get into any of them. So, um, let's get started with the meat of the review, so to speak. What I what I liked about I there are there are a decent amount of things I liked about this movie. For one, Russell Crowe and uh, Ryan Gosling, uh, they were great together. They had this wonderful rap report with one another. They had great chemistry. Uh, they had decent comic timing. It wasn't as good as the comic timing between Val Kilmer and Robert Downey Jr. that was on display in Kiss Kiss Bang Bang. But it was still pretty good, and and considering Russell Crowe isn't really known for doing comedies, he did a decent job of what he was asked to work with. He was more of the straight guy to uh, Ryan Gosling's zany, madcap kind of. He was he was kind of like a he reminded me of a uh, Nicolas Cage from uh, Raising Arizona, the same sort of neurotic sort of you, you know easily freaked out type of character. And there's a lot of humor that comes from that. Uh, most of the, most of the best comedic moments for me were just banter back and forth between uh, Russell Crowe and uh, Ryan Gosling. Now, so yeah, I really like them. They carry the film. Uh, the film's worth watching just to see them work together and to work off each other. And uh, it's a they're, they're, it's kind of like a buddy cop sort of movie. And this is one of the first ones in a while that I've seen in the theater that act, or on home video that's a newer film that actually had partners that had chemistry with one another, which is something that's been kind of missing lately. Right along, there's no chemistry between Kevin Hart and Ice Cube. None whatsoever. Uh, bullet to the head. There's no chemistry between Stallone and Sung Kang. So here, there's at least chemistry between the two, which is a big reason why I find the film to be entertaining and enjoyable. Uh, I just, there's some other aspects of it I, I, that fall a little bit short uh, for me, and that's why I ultimately don't think it's anything more than just an above average movie, but we're talking about Shane Black here. Other than Iron Man 3, which I saw and I hated, I thought it was a piece of shit, I mean, Shane Black has a pretty good track record as either a writer or a director, so maybe I hold him to higher standards than I do other writers or directors, but there's a reason for that, because I've seen him do well, and really well. So, yeah, so maybe my expectation is a bit too high, but maybe they're where they should be, considering it's a Shane Black production. Um, but anyway, I also like Angry Rice. I thought she did a good job performance-wise. I liked her character. I liked that she was a young girl who could actually carry her, carry her own. She wasn't dead weight. That was nice to see. Uh, there were some moments, though, where she, her character got a little bit too much screen time, especially near the end. I would have cut that out so you'd have uh, more things for uh, Jackson Heat, for uh, for uh, Russell Crowe's character, Jackson Healy, and Ryan Gosling's character, Hall and March, to do. Uh, because she kind of, she ultimately does run away with the movie. She steals the film away from its two stars, which is why I would kind of give her a little bit less screen time, because she's a good character, and that actress does a great job, it's just, this is a film called The Nice Guys, it's not The Nice Guys and a girl, <laughs> so, you know, it's not The Nice Guys and a gal, but, uh, you know, that's, I just, and she's still good, but kind of trimmed her role a little bit, um, that's, I also, uh, Matt Bomer, I thought, did a good job as John Boy. He was a pretty creepy, weird villain. Reminded me a lot of Crispin Glover uh, from uh, Charlie's Angels. Uh, same sort of weird sort of villain. It's kind of, you know, it's, it's just, he's not as strange as Crispin Glover, but I got a Crispin Glover vibe. And uh, he also, this his character also reminded me of uh, the villain, the hitman from uh, The Last Boy Scout. And this film reminds me of The Last Boy Scout as well. And I'll get into more of this sort of stuff when I talk about the things I don't like about the movie, because there's a serious case of deja vu. 
Uh, now, going back to things I like about it, Shane Black's direction. He did a great job directing the movie. He really injected the film with a lot of uh, energy and style that was really much appreciated. I think the cinematography is uh, is honestly really great by Philippe Rosola. And he and, and he put like a smog filter or something on, on the camera and, and made the film look effectively seedy. Like, you know, a lot of the things that they're dealing with is a porno industry and, and stuff like that. So it looked effectively seedy, like 70s CD, you know, 70s porno, porno house CD. So I got to give the film credit for that. Uh, I, the production design is well done in the art direction. Um, the comedy is inconsistent, but there definitely are a few laugh out loud moments. Uh, one of my favorite moments in the film is where there are these protesters who are playing dead in front of the steps of, I think, some uh, either a courthouse or someplace. They're playing dead on the steps and because they're supposed to be dead because the smog has killed them. And so there's a nice little bit of yeah, back and forth between the protesters and the nice guys, uh, between, you know, Russell Crowe and um, Ryan Gosling. And uh, so there's some fun stuff there. But there's also some problems with the comedy, too, which I'll get to later. Um... The only climactic action sequence I didn't mind. It was fast. It was furious. It was fun. Uh, nothing particularly super memorable about the action sequence, but it it was fun. It was fun though. I think this film was mismarketed. I don't think it was meant to be. I, it's not really an action comedy. Excuse me. I had to get a drink. It's not really an action comedy. Uh, that's honestly. A definitely misleading advertising and that's the way that the film was marketed as and if that's what the intention was it definitely is not a great action comedy at least for me personally especially in the action department um and that's too bad that's it this has better action than some of these other action comedies i've seen like the heat but a ride along but that's not saying much i mean it, it seems like the action comedy genre is especially is really going through a hard time lately. It's like they can't seem to balance the two things together very well. And it's not an easy thing to do right. That's another thing. I, I, I think people kind of underappreciate the how fine and delicate the balance is with an action comedy, especially a successful and genuinely great one. Uh, it, it's not an easy balance to get. And I don't really think the film, this film gets that balance. It does it better at times than other films do, but it still doesn't have that, that perfect balance between action and comedy, which is one of the big problems I have with the film. As I've talked about the things that I like about it, and now we're getting to things that I don't, and there's going to be some spoilers here. So um, you've been warned. Action and comedy in this film is inconsistent, especially the action. It's either unremarkable or, or it's forgettable. The fight scenes are not shot very well. They're full of shaky cam and just a lot of who's punching who. I don't know. I don't care. Just a bunch of punch sounds and that's about it. It's really the fight scenes. I don't even know why they even bothered. There's a certain bit of intensity to them, which I'll give the film, but they lack they lack a cinematic quality. They lack something that actually, oh, wow, you know, that actually gives you more of an impact other than just the initial punches or the aftermath. Now, anything with gunplay is either done for laughs or it's, just, or John Boy is the only one who's able to hit the broadside of a barn. At least that's how I interpreted it. And I, I don't really appreciate that because it's just like a bunch of shooting in the dark and, you know, nobody's hitting anything. It's kind of like a waste of ammo and a waste of people's time to just see guns go off without even really hitting anything. And it's not PG-13, so it doesn't really have that excuse. Um, another thing, it's rated R, but other than some swearing and a little bit of blood and some of the subject material in the porn industry and some nudity, it's kind of tame. You take away the tits, you take away some of the swearing, and there isn't even really a lot of that. You know, it's not even really a hard R, which is a little bit disappointing as well. Um, 
the comedy is inconsistent. There's times where I'll be laughing and I'll be laughing heartily. There's other times where a joke just doesn't land right and it just doesn't work or it drags on way too long. There's this joke with this kid who uh, is talking about how big his dick is and it goes on for an uncomfortable amount of time and it never ceases to be funny once so I don't understand why it was stretched out for as long as it was. There's this there's these sequences in the film, they're supposed to happen randomly, and they're supposed to be funny because of how random they are, but it just doesn't work for me. Uh, humor is subjective. Uh, what one person finds funny, another p person might not, and vice versa. And the moments like when uh, Holly just throws some cold coffee on one of the villains near the end of the film... And she slips, the villain slips and falls on the cold coffee and knocks herself out. I didn't find funny. I just found that stupid. That's not what I call a hilarious a sequence of events. It's just randomness. That's just silly and dumb. But that's just me personally. It just That did not land at all for me. And the hallucinations, I don't know what the film is doing with those. I understand the stuff with, the one thing with Nixon kind of fit in. Because of the story that uh, Healy said to uh, to Ryan Gosling's character March earlier, but it's just I don't the bee. I understand they've been talking about killer bees throughout the whole movie, but it's still that felt like something out of uh, Fear and Loathing in Las Vegas or or The Big Lebowski, and it just it didn't it was really out of place, um, and it wasn't really that funny either. Great effect of the bee, but I, I don't know why the hell that was even in the movie. Just to show that March is uh, extreme is, is such an extreme alcoholic. He when he falls asleep drunk at the wheel, he hallucinates. I he dreams about giant bees. I, I <laughs> fucking don't know. Um, the film also it lacks a strong villain. It lacks a a villain. It just deals with the whole corporate entity is the bad guy thing. And I think this film would have benefited a lot from just being more straightforward, to the point, and simple. Not trying to be some conspiracy theory stuff. Because that's what it ultimately ends up. And, and, that, and to me, the film, the, the whole plot, the whole reveal of everything is disappointing to me personally. Because it's this deep, intricate, just, it just, yeah. I, I've seen this before, and I just thought it would have been better if it just didn't go that route. Just a little bit more straightforward. And But instead, it's dealing with something to do with the auto industry, uh, and they're working with the Department of Justice, and Kim Basinger's character, and and because there's something to do with the car part that they made that doesn't really do that good of a job of filtering, you know, the air... You know, for filtering all the toxins and stuff that go through the carburetor into the air. So that's why the smog is so bad. And of course, they don't care because they're <laughs> the evil automobile industry men <laughs> who only care about money. And, and so it's just. That was underwhelming to me, the big reveal. And I kind of figured it out before the movie did. So that was that was also very underwhelming. I didn't, that didn't happen with Kiss Kiss Bang Bang. It didn't happen that way for me. And you can figure stuff out, like, you know, the connection between whoever in the last Boy Scout with the NFL, or the, the it's not really NFL, but it might as well be. But that film, the, that film works. That, that, that sort of reveal doesn't bother me. Here it does, because other than the two leads and the young girl, you have weak villains. Kim Basinger has nothing to do except to be the woo surprise villain. Uh, John Boy shows up halfway through the film. He doesn't have much to do either. He's just he doesn't have very much lines. He's just a guy with a gun, like the hitman for the last Boy Scouts. Um, you also have uh, Kim Basinger's daughter, who she's the one that they're all looking for. And she she basically gets shot in the most anticlimactic way possible for laughs or just for just to try to shock the audience. And I admit it was surprising, 
But then it was at the same time, it felt like I was punched in the gut because I'm like, well, that's pointless. So, so you have that whole thing that they're trying to stop, save the girl. She gets shot and killed in the most anticlimactic way imaginable. Then you get to the climax when after all the carnage is over, after everything's all said and done, the only person that goes to jail for anything is Kim Basinger, but everything stays the same because somebody else takes her place, just like she said, so nothing is ever accomplished. The nice guys don't do shit. The, the status quo remains the same, and it's just kind of like, wow, all of that that they went through is completely fucking pointless. That bothers me. That really does. I'm not a fan of that type of ending, but that's just me. And I didn't find the plot that interesting or that intriguing. The whole idea of we need to keep the air clean and there's a conspiracy with the auto industry and the Department of Justice and they're working together and they're, they're going to form, you know, the, the League of Supervillains. <laughs> they're going to go up against the Justice League. I, I don't really I don't really care about that. Less of this conspiracy theory bullshit and just do something that's straightforward and simple. I mean, we don't need to have this intricate plot. We didn't it wasn't necessary for this type of movie with these two with this bumbling a PI and, a, and an over the hill enforcer. It was just absolutely necessary to have this intricate plot. What I liked about a film like the Big Lebowski, for instance, which this film also feels like it's trying to be. And what's crazy is The Big Lebowski, to me, captured the 70s better than this movie does. And this is a movie that's supposed to take place in the 70s. Big Lebowski is also a much better comedy and a much better mystery. Because it, 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 it looked like The Big Lebowski might go into some, you know, in-depth sort of... Uh, you, you know, conspiracy theory stuff, you know, but it doesn't. That's what's so fun about The Big Lebowski and so brilliant about it is that it seems like it's going to go into this, into the rabbit hole type plot where everything's going to get more and more complex, but in reality, it's, it's not. And uh, th that that's what's really cool about it. Um, plus, you have, the, it's just, yeah, I, I can't even, you can't even compare The Big Lebowski to this. It seems like with the hallucination scenes, that's what Shane Black was trying to go for, Big Lebowski vibe, and it just doesn't work. It also feels like an appeal, it's, it's, it pales in comparison to his other film, Kiss Kiss Bang Bang, which is just a much better film with a very similar concept. And when, you come, when it comes to all these other Shane Black films that he's written and he's been a part of, this film isn't anywhere near as good to me. I mean, I personally think The Long Kiss Goodnight is a better movie than this. I definitely feel The Last Boy Scout is, and that has similarities to this as well. You have an unlikely pairing of two unlikely people who meet and have to work together to stop some sort of thing that's going on, and then there's also a little girl who can hold her own, who is, has a bit of an attitude, and, but, you know, but instead, you know, Daniel Harris is a little bit more of an attitude than the girl here, but they can both hold their own. And then you have the stuff with, there's a hitman who's trying to go after them. It's kind of similar, similar in a lot of ways. Not completely identical. That's why I said similar and kind of similar. And, you know, Shane Black's just done better. He wrote Lethal Weapon. This doesn't capture the magic of Lethal Weapon. It feels like he's trying to do that, but it just doesn't work. See, Lethal Weapon had action and comedy. This doesn't really have... And it was consistent with its action and comedy. This isn't consistent with its action and comedy. So that's why I honestly felt... I just felt it was... It was just a little bit disappointing. So, um... But, you know, there's some good, some good things about it. Absolutely. Uh, like I said, the things about it that I liked, you know, Russell Crowe and, and Ryan Gosling. And, you know, there's a fun line that Ryan Gosling had, which I, I, I really chuckled at because I relate to this, where there's this girl that uh, Ryan Gosling's at his daughter's birthday party at a bowling alley. His daughter's brought along her friends. And there's this one friend named Janet who she just brought along because, you know, she, we're friends, but not really type thing. And Ryan Gosling says something like, Jesus Christ, or oh my God. And the Janet's like, oh, you use the Lord's name in vain. And, and I, I love Ryan Gosling's reaction here. 
He's like, you don't, she's like, you don't use the Lord's vein, vein. And then he's like, I didn't use it in vain. I found it very useful. <laughs> I thought that was great. I, I, I'm, I'm going to totally use that. Like there's people in my family or people out there. You, you, oh, oh, you used the Lord's name in vain. No, I didn't. I found it very useful. <laughs> uh, but, uh, so there's definitely moments like that that are hilarious. And then there's other jokes that don't work. And then there's some fun bits of action. And then there's just a bunch of shooting at stuff that doesn't go anywhere. And shitty fight scenes. Um, you know, it's it's it kind of looks like the 70s, but really isn't. I mean, there's some fun stuff to see. Like you see billboards of Jaws 2 and Airport 77, which kind of makes me wonder how they got the rights for the show those, though, since they're Universal films, not Warner Brothers movies. But, you know, that's just... A little thing. It was fun to see Joel Gerard, you know, the guy who played Buck Rogers in the 70s show. Uh, he plays like this old guy. I think he's like the head of the automobile. He's the one, he's the guy behind the conspiracy. It's Buck Rogers' fault. Damn you, Buck Rogers. So it was kind of fun to see stuff like that. It was fun to see the vintage sort of 70s stuff. The So, you know, it, it, it was a fun movie, but it doesn't really get much further than that for me because plot wasn't that interesting or engaging for me personally it lacked a strong compelling villain it it also the action and the comedy were inconsistent and the, though that's the two and the pacing the pacing was a huge problem the film felt long and it is long it's an hour and 56 minutes and that's too long if you ask me it just felt long it, it was sluggish it it didn't really have a good flow. It didn't. It, it just kind of meandered around, like it was just some little tiny, you know, just like a leisurely sh drive through, you know, the streets of L.A. Or, or it got or it got stuck in traffic. It was just so there. It, it was it. It was a film that was like good in spurts. Oh, this is a good moment. Then it stops and stalls, and then it starts up again. Uh, one reviewer put it pretty nicely. He said the film is kind of like uh, experiencing L.A. traffic. I, I, I got to admit, yeah, it is kind of like being in traffic. Like not really, really congested traffic, but just traffic that's congested enough that, you know, you don't keep going, you know, in, at a fast enough pace. And, and that's that's one of the biggest problems I have with the film is its pacing. Um, that really hurts the film and makes it kind of uh there were times when i sit in the theater just being like kind of feels like we're just we're just going for, we're just going from scene to scene here we're not really there doesn't seem to be a lot of uh, a definite flow it just seems like it just uh cut go to the next scene cut go to the next scene it was just it was just kind of you know, it, it, Shane Black's right. His uh, directing is fine, and I don't, maybe the editing needed some work. Maybe his writing needed some work. Maybe it was the other guy who needed some work. I don't know. Overall, it's a film that I liked, but I didn't love, and I'm surprised to even say that to you guys. I wanted to love this movie. I wanted to be the guy who's going to be sitting here and saying this is a great movie. Run out and see it, but I can't. I honestly can't do that. But I still liked it. Uh, I didn't hate it. This isn't a rant. Put away the pitchforks. I hope you didn't bring them out earlier. Because it's too late anyway. Uh, but. People, it's never too late for pitchforks. But anyway. Um, I don't know what else to say. Except. Uh, the Nice Guys. It was a nice movie. It was a nice little entertaining flick. It was a nice throwback film. Uh, it, I, I just thought it could have been better. But at the same time. I still enjoyed it, and I don't know what else to say, except it was rated out of five stars. I would give it three and a half out of five stars, because I think it's an above-average film, which isn't bad. Being better than average isn't bad. It's just, I thought it was going to be a lot better than average, not a little bit. But anyway, thank you for watching, uh, and as always, I will see you guys later. See ya.